Okay, hi everyone. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Self-Service of Cloud Services for Kubernetes Application. I'm Christy Tan, Marketing Communications Manager here at CNCF. I'll be moderating today's webinar. We would like to welcome our presenter today, Lewis Marshall, Cloud Native Delivery Advocate at Aptiva. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop in your questions and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that Code of Conduct. Basically, please be respectful of all your fellow participants and presenter. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF website at cncf.io slash webinars. With that, I'll hand it over to Lewis to kick off today's presentation. Take it away, Lewis. Thank you, Christy. Um, and thank you, um, CNCF, for um, hosting this webinar. Um, so self-service of cloud resources for Kubernetes applications. So a little bit about myself um, before I kick off. Um, so I'm a site reliability engineer um, and developer and tech evangelist. So we'll see how that goes um, at Apfia. Um, I've had over 28 years now of development experience, um, always with an operations focus. Started off with 8086 assembly um, for that little machine at the top right there. Um, and more recently, um, concentrating on Golang, Kubernetes and cloud um, with Apfia. So self-service of cloud resources for Kubernetes applications specifically. So um, what we're going to try and cover today, um, introduction and um, why this isn't necessarily um, easy, um, a bit about the problem domain um, with a specific focus for uh, a developer experience and self-service, uh, a description of what that is and what that looks like in reality, a quick demo of using custom resources in Kubernetes to uh, self-serve cloud resources uh, and a summary of the industry and a little bit about um, Appvia's approach as we have our open source product um, trying to tackle this play issue. Um, and then a summary and some questions. It would be good to get some feedback and answer that. So introduction, why isn't this easy? Um, so we've learned from doing self-service um, for many years um, is the industry is moving rapidly in this very space, and there's a lot of products in the industry um, with a focus around cloud infrastructure per se, but not many of them are, have a developer specific focus or slant. Um, and the developer solutions or solutions that come close to the, develop, the developer domain um, seem to be being, being replaced in the industry. There's a movement uh, um, within the industry away from uh, self-serve and simplicity back towards operation and cloud domain specific solutions um, and we will cover a bit more about that later um, so we've had to implement um, a solution um, that's custom and wrap some of what exists in the industry to get a good um, outcome for our open source um, product so let's have a little um, look at the problem we're from a developer focus so Developer works with um, Kubernetes, um, but before even that, they'll deal with uh, containers. Um, and they're very used to shipping containers um, for uh, a method for shipping their application itself, but also for um, testing um, their application with application dependencies. Uh, obviously, containers make it very easy to um, consume a lot of uh, application dependencies like databases, um, message queues, etc. Um, but fundamentally, the developer concern is around the libraries that they build into their application and the containers that they may use locally to provide um, the um, access that those libraries need over a protocol. And they don't really deal with cloud directly per se in that space. Um, and as soon as they do, the velocity um, of using uh, the uh, cloud services uh, uh, slows their development cycle down. Um, 
and cloud consumption is often broken and gated and requires specialist knowledge, which is why uh, Velocity is effective. So what does the developer need um, when it comes to consuming um, application um, dependencies? Um, an application um, will be shipped to a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and here we have um, a picture of that. Um, but they depend through that code library um, that wraps a protocol on a dependency in here we depict a database. Um, but why do we need managed services at all? Um, it's really about removing operational overhead from a team. When the crown jewels are in the state of what your application delivers on, um, sometimes having as many eyes on that service as possible. Um, so the reliability um, could dr dramatically be improved by consuming something from a cloud provider that provides something across the entire industry in that space. Um, so reliability and potentially, or ideally, simplicity would be provided. So what's the problem? Um, here we have an application in Kubernetes um, and a developer who's responsible for that application. Um, but typically there's a DevOps or um, a, a different mindset required for um, the operations side of the piece where it comes to uh, cloud services. Um, and there's a, at least a mind shift um, between those two types of operation. Um, and why does that mind shift exist? Um, it's really around the, uh, the way you deliver those two very different solutions traditionally. So developers create their containerized applications. They're familiar with that, um, uh, potentially extraordinarily familiar with creating those containers and then shipping them to Kubernetes, which then orchestrates those in a Kubernetes cluster. Um, but an operations guy, um, or a DevOps professional may be using configuration management tools. Um, here we have an example of Terraform talking to Amazon Web Services or any specific cloud provider, which would then broker and manage um, a instance of a cloud um, service or a cloud resource um, that the application may depend on. So let's talk a bit more about self-service because why is it even important? Why do we need this? Um, so when it comes to cloud services, they're a dependency of, of an application um, and we'd want to reduce lead time. So when there is no separate team and no manual intervention required, um, there's no manual process around that separate, um, separate st set of steps required to procure those cloud services. Um, but fundamentally, when you've got two different mindsets or two different tooling paths and worst case, two whole different pipelines to deliver updates, you've got application updates have to be coordinated and um, communicated with uh, cloud updates. So there's a, a brittle, um, a brittle uh, a, an issue that can occur due to those separate concerns and coordination effort that may be required to deliver updates. Um, and fundamentally, why self-serve? We want to enable an agile process. Um, enabling agile delivers on a reduced cost fundamentally, but the reason it does, I mean, it, it's talked about um, often and elsewhere, so I'm touch on this lightly, but fundamentally, um, detecting defects um, in a code base or the code base's dependency early in a cycle is vitally important because the cost of remedying those def same defects later on when it's in front of customers or in production um, is vastly increased. So reducing cost. Um, now there's a perceived risk um, in some circles around self-service. Um, so we want to ensure that we can limit that risk by providing an informed choice um, so at this point, I want to um, introduce an analogy here between our developer and our operations with regards to um, a mobile phone. So in a mobile phone shop, we procure not just a mobile phone, but a, um, an operations piece to that, a service, um, often referred to as a plan, which can condense that best practice and simplify it 
so that all the operational concerns aren't back up and the cost of running and, and um, other security issues could be simplified down to a simple choice. Um, now, limiting risk with regards to uh, running costs, um, there would be a perceived risk um, if you don't trust your staff. Now, obviously, the staff development at the moment, um, we're all in a, in a climate where we've, we're trusting staff a lot, um, but the staff that fundamentally put code um, together that has a business focus should be trusted arguably the most um, in an organization. Um, and there's a further reduction of cost with the agility and reliability concerns that I've already spoken to. Um, but further, um, the security um, risk um, we think is reduced by having an informed choice and packaging that up as a product and a service that can be easily consumed um, and not communicated or lost in communication um, and maybe introducing human error aspects. Um, so develop a service, what would that look like in an ideal world? We should be able to procure um, a cloud dependency of our application with a, a simple service description. We should be able to give that um, instance of an application a name, um, and refer to a plan um, as if we're just taking off the shelf. It should be very straightforward, shouldn't limit our agility. So we post a request to something which then talks to any cloud provider and then provides back exactly what the application actually depends on, which at this point is access configuration, um, which typically comes down to an endpoint, the network connectivity details and um, credentials. Uh, the um, means of accessing uh, a resource securely. So what's that look like in practice? Um, there's a lot of industry assumptions around Kubernetes resources being the best way to deliver this. Um, now native Kubernetes resources are um, well documented. They manage resources very well. Um, and they're typically pertaining to applications generally. So application domain is well understood by a developer who's created their application and shipped it in a container. Um, most of what they would look up um, around Kubernetes makes sense. Um, and the ideal around reconciling an intended state and not describing the how of exactly you move a container from node A to node B is very desirable when it comes to cloud resources. But in practice, when Kubernetes is extended um, to um, relate to uh, cloud resources. Um, it's not that simple um, because there's a lot of domain specific knowledge required um, in the operations space um, in the worst case. Um, and the developer may not quite understand what's the benefit to them to have to change that persona and, and understand those other concerns. So a custom resource for a cloud service could look just like a Kubernetes source, like any other. And there's a couple of examples here um, with operators that the industry is um, moving towards, one from Google and one from Amazon here, both with an almost identical um, requirement around um, a Redis uh, dependency for our application. And we can use familiar tools um, to create and procure and ship those application dependencies, but fundamentally, the parameters between those two couldn't be more different. And they, in this case, the, they, they both show some operation domain knowledge that is required under study of a cloud provider, or in the worst case, specific infrastructure um, that may be required. So how do we scale custom resources so that they make a bit more sense maybe? Um, well, at the moment, um, we have different specifications for each cloud. There's domain specific knowledge required and there's no consistency for the developer. Um, and there's no guidance, more, almost more importantly, about the security and the best practice about which plan and how to use it. Fundamentally, there's no high level abstraction for those Kubernetes resources and those operators. So at this point, it's worth delving into history as it informs where we are today in the industry. and um, some of the most mature uh, aspects of uh, providing this capability in Kubernetes is around the service catalog project, which is um, 
a means to wrap the open service broker API on Kubernetes. It's a Kubernetes native project. Um, and it's born out of um, using a facility that existed and was invented by Cloud Foundry in the industry. Um, and it does provide custom resources, but its production readiness status um, with regards to self-service specifically is questionable because the industry is changing and, and moving its focus, maybe because uh, the Cloud Foundry uh, re requirements may not match where the cloud operators are going with regards to Kubernetes specifically. Um, but it does provide service broker plans. It provides a way of simplifying the access to cloud service and ideally provides some best practice at the point of consumption if configured and set up right. Um, and also can vet or reduce the scope of what service, what services and and which particular plans around those services are available um, in a particular cluster. Um, so I'll dig one layer down to uh, go over that quickly. So we have service brokers, um, which are code that already exists, and they can be deployed in multiple systems. But in this case, we're showing how they integrate with the service catalog project in Kubernetes um, by publishing plans, and then the developer can request a service from that service catalog, which then passes that request onto a service broker, which talks to a cloud provider, which provides status information back to the service catalog, which allows the application to be wired up to use it. So a concrete example of that would be um, using the Amazon Web Services service broker um, and a relational database service production development plans being published to the service catalog. The developer can choose a production ready relational database service, um, which generates a service instant request to the service broker using the um, open uh, service broker API. And then the cloud provider um, can be managed by that service broker, um, which would uh, provide the details um, about a specific instance and the status back to the service catalog, which can then provision the details for consuming that in what's called a, um, a service binding. So I'm going to do a quick demo of what that looks like and I'm going to cover the use of plans um, and how um, we consume that application configuration. And on the right here we've got a, um, a view of uh, consuming an S3 bucket with two resources in Kubernetes. One's called a service instance um, which has the name of a plan um, and a service and no parameters in this case. So we're quite happy with defaults provided um, in this instance. Um, and then a service binding, which relates to the shape of how our application will consume that specific service with a secret name. So the developer can request um, both the service instance and the service binding, which describes what we need and how our application will be shaped to consume that with the configuration. So without further ado, I'll use a demo I provided earlier in a bit of webinar magic. So here we have a look at um, secrets and we can see there's the default token for service account in this default namespace here. And we'll have a quick look at a S3 service catalog instance description, the same one that I showed earlier with no parameters and more importantly, the service binding, how our application will be wired up to consume that. So at this point, I can go ahead and apply that to a cluster. And a little bit of magic later, we can see that that service instance should exist within the cluster. Now, although the service instance description is in the cluster, the actual service is obviously being um, created and managed by the um, service catalog and the service broker in turn, and then the cloud operator. And we'll watch that resource and use a little bit of magic speed up there. And we'll see the status goes to true, which means the cloud service should have been provisioned. So at this point, 
we have a look at the service instance, maybe clear up the screen, have a look at that again, and we can see that its status has turned to ready. So what we now want to look at is how to get to that at our, with our, within our application. And we can see that a secret name has been referred to by our service binding, which also says it's ready. So if we have a look at secrets, as if by magic, we have a secret with the name that we specified in our service binding. So now all there is to do is consume that um, secret in a Kubernetes deployment. So we have a Kubernetes deployment YAML here with a reference to a secret and specific environment variables that are familiar to anyone who's consumed uh, Amazon services from a, an application. Um, and we can see that that deployment gets ready. Now, instead of running a, a fully fledged application at this point, I'm going to use a Kubernetes debugging technique to connect my laptop to an interactive shell session inside the workload inside the Kubernetes cluster. And at this point, we can have a look at the environment variable bucket name, and we can use the Amazon Web Services API to file the command line interface to look that there's nothing in that bucket. And we can copy something that exists in every container or most to that bucket and see that it exists. So that was a real quick walkthrough of um, the Amazon Service Broker and a, 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 a tangible, hopefully, um, overview of what that actually looks like in practice, but it covers up a lot of complexity. So here we have um, a product comparison across um, open source uh, capability in the industry. Um, we have the Amazon Web Service Service Broker there with loads of application services. Now they're dependent on uh, cloud formation templates that are provided and there's a bunch of default um, uh, templates provided, but really you need to look at those in detail, or at least understand them um, for production use cases. Um, and you've got to understand a lot more besides about how that's actually wired up in practice um, when you're self-serving across uh, multiple clusters or scoping credentials to um, particular workloads. Um, but more importantly, the future is what's uncertain in this space. We like the idea it's got plans um, and service brokers for self-service providing plans is a very good high level abstraction. So for a developer, it's a, it's a nice thing. Um, but Amazon have stated that their service operator is their intended direction, but it's a very early stage in the project. So it's a bit too early to comment in any more detail. I wouldn't say there's a minimum viable product on a branch for the latest iterator, iteration of that project. There are other service brokers that exist um, for Azure and Google Cloud project, um, but both of those large cloud operators have put their sub a lot of resources into slightly different directions going forward. So Google have a Google Config Connector, um, which is referred to in uh, their Anthos product suite as being core to Anthos, but um, importantly, to unpick here is the fact that the, uh, although Anthos describes itself as being multi-cloud, the Google Config Connector is certainly focused only on uh, Google um, Cloud uh, Platform. Um, so for self-service, um, it's not um, as simple as it could be. Crossplane is worth a mention here. Um, they it's provided um, and backed by um, Microsoft and Alibaba Cloud, um, but it's also got some really interesting ideals around um, application focus with traits um, and a new initiative around the open application model. Um, but more of the resources um, pertain to cloud infrastructure than applications at this point. So it's an interesting one to watch. Um, Terraform, there's new operators, both from HashiCorp, um, and uh, Arantia Labs, um, but both of those are extraordinarily early. And because of their infrastructure focus and the domain specific language, they don't really relate to developer self-service. So 
that's an overview with regards to self-service developers, leaving a developer maybe a little bewildered about what they could deploy to their cluster and consume within their team. Um, so at this point, I want to touch on the cloud vendors direction. Um, they have motives that are clearly commercial and quite rightly so, um, and they want to support many customers um, and their focus is about reliability at scale, which is a fantastic reason to want to consume managed services in the first place. But because of that uh, holistic um, lowest common denominator approach, the complexity has to be put on the customer. So the self support aspect is, is very real. Um, and also they're not really driving out multi-cloud. Obviously they've all got their own um, reasons uh, and, and uh, tie-in products. So they don't necessarily save the customer time and money uh, with regards to self-service for cloud resources here. So Appia has an open source product called Core, which centers around um, self-service of Kubernetes clusters. And we're iterating into providing uh, cloud services. So a developer would be able to request a service plan, a high level abstraction from core, which would broker that to different technologies um, as we um, filter the industry and provide um, a set of um, concrete absolute production level ideals um, in an open source product. Um, and then at the point of consumption, the application can get that simply. So I'm going to do a quick demo now of using a user interface to self-service plans um, and provide that simplicity um, and then run a, um, an application to consume them. So here we have the open source cloud um, project uh, core running the interface. Um, now, we think it's important to have a, a distinction between the operation side that can set the plans both from uh, an open source project where the community can uh, procure what are good plans, but then again, a, a, a particular organization can further define what is in a plan and, and, and what that looks like. But we're going to consume that from a team where uh, the agility um, and work can have been prior um, organized. So we have a, a, an EKS cluster here and we want to provide um, a cloud service. Now, under the hood, we want to provide uh, a, a custom resource definition um, and a command line interface. Um, so familiar tooling and, and techniques can be used. But while we're discovering how to use those, we think a user interface gives a big uplay, uplift for a developer where they can look at the parameters um, and decide whether they suit uh, a particular uh, requirement. Um, so here we're going to um, create a cloud resource for S3 and we're going to get details back about that cloud resource um, in a secret, in a specific Kubernetes cluster, in a specific namespace. And all the developer needs to provide is a service name for the, how they're referring to this um, with a service plan. Now that's providing a cloud service um, instance for uh, development. Now it's possible to use one instance for multiple environments for some types of services. Um, and in this case, we want to provide a discrete bucket for each instance of our application, but we want the same um, service name. Now it's easy to keep these the same when the plans provide an abstraction point where all the configuration can be done once in advance. So at this point, we want to get access to that. Um, and the benefits of a user interface obviously allow us to have a rich experience for the developer where they can find out how to consume that within Kubernetes, what the resource names are called, um, et cetera. So now we're going to deploy um, an application to Kubernetes. Looks very similar to before. Um, we have uh, a secret reference there. Um, and we're going to consume a Kubernetes cluster by getting access 
all these interface here, finding out how to do that. Switch you back to the CLI. I can set up our single sign on and now switch context to get access to that specific cluster and the namespace where we want to deploy an instance of that application. So now we can deploy that application. We didn't really need to know much up front, um, but we could look at CRDs um, that have been created behind the scenes. We can look at how they're consumed um, using kubectl later, um, and then put those in uh, GitOps or, or however we um, work within this, a, any particular organization. We've created an application there. You can see it's already running. I may have done that before. Um, and now what we're going to do is connect our desktop um, to the running pod, the running container within that Kubernetes cluster in order to use a web browser to access it without worrying about ingress and other types of resources at this point. So as a developer, it's very straightforward to consume S3 when we have a rich user interface to do that and then get access to an application which has picked up the relevant configuration from whatever technology in the background has provided it um, and we can then persist some state. So there's a quick overview of some of the thoughts and ideals we think are important in this space. Um, I hope um, some of this resonates. If we just finish up there, we create a couple of objects which are persisted. Okay, so in summary, we think the current solutions um, that exist across the industry in this space um, are, have an operations heavy focus and they replay a certain amount of complexity um, back, um, which can hamper the agility. We like the idea of a high level abstraction um, and plans um, as a terminology makes a lot of sense. It provides simplicity for developers and hopefully increases agility. But almost more importantly, you can condense all the best practice into a plan um, and provide oversight um, and good practice around audit and compliance around ISO standards um, and what have you um, with regards to those plans. So I'll invite you to look up um, about Appvia. I won't go into any of the details. I'll want to skip quickly over this slide. Um, uh, other than say we provide the core project um, and it'll be good to answer any questions um, at this point. Um, and I'll leave uh, contact details and our Git repository there um, for um, your um, access there. Okay, thank you very much. That, that's the end of my portion. Um, if I could now um, have the questions. Yeah, and thanks so much, Lewis, for a great presentation. Um, as Lewis mentioned, we now have time for questions. Uh, just a reminder, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, please drop it in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your um, Zoom screen and we'll uh, get through as many as we can. We have a few that populated here, so I'll read them aloud. Um, the first one here is from an anonymous attendee. It says, can you import an existing S3 buckets as service instance into the Kubernetes cluster? That is a, a brilliant question. Um, and it's one that um, a lot of projects in the industry um, have uh, skirted around. And indeed, um, if you're providing um, a, a new way of getting access to cloud resources, it's probably best to migrate to um, something that provides that uplift rather than trying to ask um, something that um, condenses a whole bunch of best practice to change its shape suddenly to bring in something that may or may not be compliant. It's a good question though, but it's, there's no magic bullet here in that space. Okay, um, the next question is, and I apologize if I'm butchering this, it's Vladislav. He's asking who manages a service broker? 
is it a corresponding CSP collaborating with a Kubernetes SIG or an independent vendor? So at the moment uh, in the industry, um, uh, delivering the service brokers um, and how they're wired up um, in a specific cluster or in a uh, operations cluster and what that looks like um, is a problem for um, the uh, the individual organization. Um, but there is some good technology there, um, not just from a particular broker, but across a whole bunch of operators. So um, in our instance, in the core product, we provide plans and automation in the core product to deliver all of the technology stack so that at the point of consumption, the developer doesn't need to worry about it. We provide building blocks in core to deliver all of the above so that you don't need to um, worry about it as an operational concern. Um, that's uh, something we, we want to take on. Okay, we have another question here from Daniel. <clears throat> Daniel says, uh, thanks for a nice presentation. Is there any offering overlap with VMware Tanzu applications catalog self-service? He says, I believe there is an open source version of it as well. Um, so not really directly. I mean, I've been speaking to uh, cloud services specifically, um, and Tanzu uh, has a, an application catalog which talks across cloud and in cluster. Um, and it's a, a similar area to where we're addressing, but uh, I think our focus is certainly on driving down um, complexity to make it absolute simple at the point of consumption for a developer. So it's slightly overlapping in respect to many, uh, many of the products in the industry, but at the point of use, the simplicity is where we think uh, a product like Core, um, uh, the open source project and the community can engage, please do, <laughs> to uh, test and, and make sure that we're on track in that space. Okay. Um, well, it looks like that's all the questions that have been submitted so far. Um, any, oh, here we got another one. <laughs> and apologies, Vlad, if I'm saying your name wrong, it's Vladislav is asking a uh, follow up to my previous question. Apiva core approach is excellent and clear, but what about service brokers you've compared in the table? So, under the hood, we um, are using uh, in our first iteration, we have a feature uh, gated uh, capability, uh, which is at alpha at the moment, where we're using the, the Amazon service broker, but we're um, populating the specific plans um, to be very specific cloud formation templates that we know to be good um, and fit operational uh, concerns that we have tested. Um, and we also have some operators um, from the Google uh, config connector that we want to integrate with um, in that space. So I guess the, uh, in the, simpli the simplest answer is to say, yes, some of the technology in that table we would want to use, but um, we want to orchestrate and automate how it's delivered and provide a higher level abstraction so that regardless of whether it be a service broker providing the specifics of a plan or an operator, you get the same experience um, as a user. Okay. Yeah, well, it looks like those are all the questions um, today. Thanks again, Lewis, for a very informative uh, presentation. That's all the questions and time that we have for today. Thanks again to everyone for joining us. Uh, a friendly reminder that the webinar recording and slides will be online later today. We look forward to seeing you at a future CNCF webinar. Have a great day and stay safe. Thanks, everyone.